This video is sponsored by Squarespace. Tonight, I'm using my biggest telescope and my smallest sensor. <laughs> but why? Well, because I'm going after a deep sky object that is tiny in terms of uh, apparent diameter. Tonight, I'm gonna attempt to photograph the bright core of the Cat's Eye Nebula in the constellation Draco. And this is by far the smallest deep sky object I've ever attempted. And so I'm gonna throw out all the usual methods that I normally use for imaging and processing and try something completely different, completely new to me, and bring you along for the journey, uh, but also explain a little bit about why I'm doing this and what I'm doing. So my name is Nico and you are watching Nebula Photos. Hey, so if you're new to the channel, as the channel name Nebula Photos suggests, what I'm interested in as a photographer are nebulae. And these are colorful gas clouds that are, in my opinion, some of the most beautiful natural objects in the universe. And it's just amazing to me how accessible they are for backyard photographers. Uh, this video is not where I'd start for learning how to capture nebulae yourself. I have much better videos for complete beginners that go start to finish, and I have a playlist for those that I'll link. Uh, but what I'm gonna be doing in this video is more of an advanced technique with advanced gear, and it's called lucky imaging. And my reason for documenting it is there has been some interest in my Patreon community. So much interest that this past month, we've actually been working on a lucky imaging challenge together and that's something we do every month take on a new imaging challenge over on the patreon side of the discord and I think that's a great way to stay sharp as an astrophotographer it's something I love about the hobby you know to be constantly challenging myself you know with new ideas new techniques so what is lucky imaging well, before I explain it, I have to go take a few steps back and let's start with the term angular resolution. Resolution just means what is the smallest detail you can resolve? So for example, if I put this small bottle of Noodler's ink a few hundred feet away, if I photograph it with a telescope, we can still resolve very small details. You can even still see that it says made in USA on the label. If I instead use a wide angle camera lens, my resolving power goes way down and now I can't even really make out that there's a bottle of ink there on the rock because the resolution decreased. Um, so that's the trade-off. For getting a much wider field of view, you won't be able to resolve very small details when you zoom in on the photo. Now, angular resolution is just a way of measuring detail by describing the apparent diameter of an object in degrees of arc. Basically, if you imagine measuring the horizon to horizon, that would be 180 degrees of arc, so half a sphere. And now you can break up a single degree of arc into 60 parts, we call those arc minutes. And then if you break up each of those arc minutes into 60 parts, we call those arc seconds. And you can then describe the apparent diameter of anything in your field of view using this angular resolution. So now let's get to the telescope. And if you've heard the term, you know, X arc seconds per pixel, like one arc second per pixel is a common recommendation for deep sky imaging. That's describing the theoretical angular resolution of a telescope plus a camera, meaning, you know, with this scope and this camera, what is the smallest detail that can be resolved by a pixel on the camera sensor? So if you say one arc second per pixel, you're saying theoretically, you could make out a detail that's only one arc second big. Uh, but unfortunately, pixel scale uh, is just one part of the whole solution with true resolution, uh, because there's other physical limits that uh, will limit the actual amount of detail that can be resolved. Uh, and there's two main ones, so we can briefly discuss them. The seeing limit uh, is caused by air turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere, and the diffraction limit um, is just comes down to physics uh, with your telescope size. And you'll also see that called the Dawes limit or the Rayleigh criterion. It's, it's entirely determined by the aperture of your telescope, how big it is. So if you wanna resolve really small details uh, and you have very steady skies, then you'll need a bigger telescope to do that because otherwise the diffraction patterns of the uh, light sources in your photos are gonna blur together and you won't be able to make out the smallest details. But the, the limit that affects way more of us uh, in you know, most places on Earth is the, is the limit from your, your sky conditions, your seeing. 
basically when you're looking up at the night sky, you know, it looks transparent. It looks like there's nothing between us and the stars. But actually the sky, the Earth's atmosphere is still there. Um, you know, what we see is a blue sky during the day. Uh, it's still there, it's just not illuminated by sunlight but it can still uh, cause a bunch of issues for us astrophotographers. You know, the two main ones uh, being that it can be lit up by artificial light uh, shining up on it. Uh, this is called light pollution. And then when, you know, there's more water vapor in the sky or smoke, it gets much worse. And when it gets worse, we call that poor transparency. So when, you, when, the, when the sky isn't very transparent, it sort of looks like there's this like uh, thick layer of light between us and the, and the night sky. And the, but the, the more important to the discussion today is seeing. And this has to do with different layers of atmosphere um, between us and space. And uh, they are all moving in different sort of uh, directions and at different speeds, and that's turbulence. And th this turbulence causes uh, a lot of blur in our images. So um, you can see it if you, you know, if you look at the moon at high power, you can actually see the, the turbulence in the air. And uh, if it, when it's a really uh, steady night, um, it, it will be, give you a much clearer view. Now, what the professional astronomers do is they build their observatories in places where the seeing is typically excellent. Um, the, the best places on Earth to do this are mountaintops, you know, very high elevation where you can get above a lot of the poor seeing, and then also uh, near oceans where uh, you can have um, inversion layers and laminar flow and all these terms that have to do with basically the air currents being very smooth and lined up. Now, most of us don't have the luxury of building our observatories on mountaintops, uh, but the good news is there's a technique called lucky imaging that can help quite a bit with poor seeing. Um, if you're a planetary imager, you probably have already come across this technique. The idea is if you shoot uh, with a high speed video, like 60 or even 100 frames per second, there will be moments where all of the turbulence in the air uh, lines up in a way to give you a nice clear view of space. And if you're taking thousands and thousands of frames, you may get hundreds where you're lucky and, you, and at least some part of, of the planet's surface or the moon's surface is showing a good amount of detail. And then when you stack all of these good frames together, you end up with a much sharper image of the planet or the sun or the moon um, than your seeing conditions would normally allow. That's why they say it's like beating the seeing. Now, the faster you can make the frame rate, the luckier you'll get, right? Because you have more chances to get lucky. So this doesn't translate to deep sky imaging very well, at least for most objects, because most objects are too dim to shoot at a high frame rate um, or, or a very short exposure. For instance, you know, if you're shooting what would be a short exposure for deep sky might be like 30 seconds, but that's still way too long to take advantage of lucky imaging because the air currents just move too fast. So uh, it, the, the blur will be baked in at, at, at 30 seconds. So then the question becomes, okay, how short do we have to make the exposures to get the advantage of lucky imaging, and that's the million dollar question. I'm sure to some degree it depends on your local sky conditions and things like that. But I've looked at a lot of people who have been successfully doing some kind of lucky imaging for deep sky, and it seems like one second might be uh, a, a good target. Now, this also might depend a little bit on F ratio, and it de definitely depends on how bright the object you're shooting is. So don't just take that one second as the end all and be all, but that's what I'm gonna be using tonight at F5.6 uh, and with the Cat's Eye Nebula. And I chose the Cat's Eye Nebula because it has a very cool shape and it's very well positioned in my sky right now. It's in the constellation Draco which is uh, easy to photograph if you have a good view to the north, which I do from my backyard observatory that I'm sitting in right now. I can see the north is nice and clear. Or I don't have any trees. So that's uh, basically the theory part of, of lucky imaging. Uh, let's now move on to the gear. And the kind of telescope you want to use is going to be your biggest, fastest 
scope. If you have, say, a motorized 16-inch F4 Dobsonian, that would be perfect for this. Uh, for me, the biggest, fastest scope that it was practical to use, because I can track with it and everything, is this Ascar 185 Apo with the F5.6 reducer. Now, for the camera, you want basically a unicorn, <laughs> a camera with very low noise, but also very small pixels. Um, and these two things often don't go together. But this one, the ATR 585C from TubeTech that uh, they sent over for review seems to fit the bill. It's 2.9 micron pixels, which are pretty small. And the read noise is also very low. From using it, I will say the fixed pattern noise is higher than you'd get from larger sensor cameras. But there's always going to be trade-offs like that. And for the, for the most part, the, that doesn't really matter too much for this kind of application. Um, the other thing that's useful about this camera is it has a small sensor. Um, you might, you know, it's 11 millimeters across, six millimeters high, 4K resolution. For, for context, a full frame sensor is usually uh, 36 millimeters uh, across by 24 millimeters high. And the bigger sensors come with bigger images in terms of file size, often 50 to 90 megabytes for a full frame. Well, this is eight megabytes. And when you're registering and analyzing thousands of images, that's very important. It also um, may be important when it comes to capture, right? If, it, if it's taking time for your computer to download a large uh, image and then start the next one, um, or if it runs out of buffer or whatever, um, that can really uh, drag you down with lucky imaging. You want something that basically works in real time, just constantly taking images. Now, if you don't have a small sensor camera like this, I haven't tested this, but I've heard you may be able to use the region of interest feature, ROI, in your capture software, and so that it basically only reads out a small cropped portion of the sensor, basically acting like a smaller sensor. I don't know if there are any downsides to that uh, since I haven't tried it, but if someone else has tried it, let me know in the comments. Uh, but I'm gonna be using this one and I think uh, it should work well. I think this is a, a good sensor size for this application. Okay, next up in terms of the actual capture process, the way I did this is after downloading the TubeTech driver, I set it up in Sequence Generator Pro where I already have the plate solving and all of that kind of good stuff configured. So then I could just easily focus and center on the object using Sequence Generator Pro, which I'm already familiar with. But for this step, you could use any control program you like, like uh, that you have connected to your mount and camera. It could be Ecos, Nina, APT, any of them. Then with the object centered and the mount tracking on it and keeping it centered in frame, I switched to SharpCap, which is a program that has some nice advantages for lucky imaging. The main one being that it can capture basically in real time and store all of the frames that it's capturing into a single SER SIR video file. So you end up with just this one efficient file with thousands of raw images in it and it's already optimized for this kind of work. It just makes it a little easier. Um, and, you, and I also found that I was able to be pretty efficient that way. I was able to gather a bit over 5,000 frames at one second each in a couple hours, and the resulting SIR video file came in at about 80 gigabytes. And that's what I'm gonna try processing with Cyril. And I'm using Cyril for a couple reasons. Uh, it's very fast at registering and stacking, so it makes uh, experimenting less painful. And then second, Cyril, unlike PixInsight or other programs, can work with these SIR sequences very efficiently, so you don't have to use other programs to convert or anything like that. Now, I will admit there are other more complicated methods for doing this kind of uh, lucky imaging processing that may result in better final images. I haven't ha had time to investigate them all, but two popular programs for lucky imaging stacking in general that also seem to have support for Deep Sky are AutoStackert, which I have used before, and AstroSurface, which I have not, but I hope to uh, sometime in the future. So anyways, I'll be using Cyril, S-I-R-I-L. It's cross-platform. It's donation supported, but uh, free to download. Before I show the processing, let me just take a quick moment to share a bit about today's sponsor, which is Squarespace. Squarespace makes it easy to make a website with their guided design system called Squarespace Blueprint. 
You can choose from many professional templates, but then style them however you'd like with the easy to use interface that I'm showing here. There is a bunch of other features built in. For example, if you wanna sell products or prints of your work, you can set up an online store and Squarespace now has flexible payments, including PayPal, Apple Pay, credit cards, Afterpay, and Clearpay, so your customers can pay however works best for them. So whether you need something simple, just an online portfolio, or a lot more complex for your website, Squarespace has you covered. And right now you can get a free trial by heading to squarespace.com slash nebula photos. And when ready to make a purchase of hosting or a domain, you can get 10% off with code nebula photos. Okay, here we are on the computer. As you can see, I'm using an external SSD over USB-C. It has plenty of free space over two terabytes because we're gonna need a lot of free space uh, for this process. All that I have right now is a folder with the sir file that we captured with sharp cap in it it's about 80 gigabytes and the first thing we're going to do here in serial is set the working directory um, so we just click the home button and set it to where we have the sir file on the external ssd of course you could do this on an internal uh, ssd as well you just would need enough space uh, which i don't have Okay, we're now gonna go over to here. We're gonna use these tabs at the top here, uh, starting with conversion and then working our way through. We're not gonna use calibration uh, for this just cause I, even though I took calibration frames for one second, I'm not sure if they're gonna work too well. We're also not gonna use the plot feature, but all the other tabs we'll use. And so in the conversion tab here, you wanna go down uh, below this empty source area to the little plus sign. Click on the plus icon. If you hover over it, it says add files to convert. And just choose your sir file in the lucky folder. I'll click add. And then we can give this sequence a name. I'm just going to call it NGC6543 which is the official name for the cat's eye nebula. And I'm gonna change it right here where it says fits images to sir sequence. Um, I have tried using fits images and the limitation is that you're, you're limited to stacking only 2048. Uh, well, with a sir sequence, you can stack as many as you, as you want, as many as your computer can handle. So I'm gonna leave it on sir sequence. And then this is very important. We need to click the debayer uh, toggle right here because these are color images. I, you know, with the 585C, um, if you were shooting mono, of course, you wouldn't have to check that. But if you're shooting color, you want to make sure to click debayer and then check your debayer settings up here in the hamburger menu under preferences. Uh, it's, you know, they should be uh, set so that it automatically finds it in the, the metadata. But, uh, just check these and then uh, if you have any problems you can always uncheck this uh, option and choose the Bayer pattern uh, manually. I'm going to leave it on automatic because uh, I think that's going to work just fine but I know that if I did it, run into any problems I could come back here and just manually choose the Bayer pattern. And by problems I mean it'll throw an error if uh, or if if it can't figure it out or uh, if you need to do some kind of manual intervention. All right, with those uh, settings all set, I'm gonna go ahead and click convert and it will start going. And the speed of any of these steps will depend on your uh, computer power. I'm using an AMD Ryzen 5950X processor, uh, which is the most important thing here in terms of how fast this can uh, chunk through this data and, and spit it out. Uh, so you can sort of see the, the speed at which it's going. And we have over 5,000 frames, so I'm going to speed this part of the video up. Okay, that's uh, done in terms of the, creating the sequence. So now what we can do is we can actually click on the sequence tab up here and it loads the first image in the preview over here. I'm gonna click on 
uh, the visualization modes. Right now it's on linear, which is why we're not seeing anything except for maybe a couple little star cores. And I'm gonna change it to, if we try auto stretch, I think that's gonna look pretty ugly. Uh, it doesn't look too bad, but you can see that the, the cat's eye nebula core, which we're interested in, is completely blown out, so that's not gonna be as useful. I'm gonna click on arc sign, and this is looking a lot better. Let me zoom in here with control scroll. Okay, and that's an example of a single one second uh, picture, and it doesn't look too good. Uh, we can sort of see a, a very blurred uh, star in the center of the planetary nebula there, and maybe a tiny bit of detail, but it, it looks pretty blurry. But what we can do next is we can open the frame list over here in the sequence tab. And this lets us quickly um, go through any frame in the sequence and see what it looks like. So I can just open up a uh, new frame randomly by just clicking on it over here in the frame list. And I can see already just clicking on a random one that it looked a little bit better than the first one, I think. Uh, that one now looks quite a bit blurrier. Uh, I don't like that one as much. Ooh, and that one looks terrible. <laughs> okay, so you can see in this one, uh, that's really blurred, right? And the, the star looks wonky over here, uh, and we don't really see any detail in the planetary nebula, so that's obviously a bad one. Okay, this one looks quite a bit better. We're seeing more detail, the shape is better. And this one's even better still, it looks a lot sharper we're not seeing as much blur. The uh, white dwarf in the center of the planetary nebula is, is nicely defined. So once you've found a frame that you think um, looks pretty sharp, you can set it as the reference image up here. And this is just helpful for uh, registration. Okay, with that set, we can go to the registration tab and I'm going to use global star alignment. I've tried some of these different ones and I think for this, this uh, global star alignment is gonna work well based on the number of stars in the picture. Uh, plenty of stars to work with. We're gonna register all images from the sequence. We'll leave all the other settings uh, alone. And so, uh, we're not going to drizzle because we didn't dither, so uh, leave that off. And we can go ahead and click Go Register. And you can see it shows you the stars that it's using for registration, and uh, there it goes. And again, uh, because my computer is pretty fast, this process will go by pretty quick, but I'll still speed up the video because uh, it'll take several minutes. Okay, you can see after finishing registration, it picked its uh, it picked a different reference image um, based on which image was sharpest. Um, that's fine. I, you know, it's it would have been rare for me to have just picked the sharpest image randomly, um, but it'll maybe use that um, in stacking now. I'm going to change the method of stacking to average stacking with reject rejection. Leave all these other settings alone except for image rejection, which I'm going to change to weighted FWHM. Uh, if you sort of just hover over this, it will describe each rejection method. And I want weighted w FWHM because it's gonna give us uh, the sharpest kind of uh, result uh, based on, which is what I'm really going for here. In addition to choosing weighted FWHM, I'm going to change the percentage of frames used. And for this, I'm gonna do an experiment where I stack this several times with different percentages of frames or images used. I'm gonna start with 15%, which you can see here is only 761 images of the 5,000 total. After this is done, I'll up that to 30%, then 50%, and 70%, and then we can just do a quick uh, comparison uh, at the end to see uh, if we can see any difference between these different amounts of images stacked. Okay, so I'll speed up this whole process of generating the images and, and doing a basic process on them so we can get to that uh, comparison. 
For those interested in terms of the processing, I kept this very simple. On each of the image stacks, I ran these five steps in serial with identical settings uh, to try to keep this comparison as fair as possible. Okay, so to give you an idea of the full 4K frame, this is shown at uh, one to one pixels uh, because it's actually a 4K video and a 4K uh, image. So this is the uh, 4K uh, processed image. Uh, so you can see even with a one second uh, image, there's plenty of stars that come out in a stack and uh, the, the core is uh, nicely uh, defined and bright there. Uh, no issue with really exposure. I think I could go down to half a second, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second here. Now let's go to the comparison. And so here's with that same 100% zoom level comparing the different uh, stacks, 15%, 30%, 50%, 70%. I can say at 100% zoom, I cannot see any difference between these. Uh, so that tells you something. <laughs> Maybe this object is too small to to really uh, see much difference. Now at the at five hundred percent zoom on it, uh, I start. I can see a little difference on my nice monitor without any compression. I can see that uh, we are losing some of the finest finest uh, details in contrast in once we get into the 50 and 70 percent stacks and we're, they're preserved better in the 15 and 30 percent uh, stacks. I am sure that a lot of people watching this on YouTube with video compression and everything are, are not going to be able to see any difference. It's quite possible that even if you were looking at it on my monitor, you'd be like, what are you what are you what difference are you even seeing here? So I will say that uh, this experiment was not fully uh, successful because it's not like a huge difference uh, in terms of uh, the lucky imaging trying to sort of get the best uh, frames. Um, but I have a few ideas of what to try next um, in terms of further experiments. So let me show you those. So. One thing I'm very interested in is shorter frames. Now that I know one second works, um, it would be cool to take a lot more at half a second because I think that one second, there was plenty of light there to work with. Um, so I think I could go down to half a second and, and it might be an even uh, sort of better result in terms of the lucky imaging. Another th thing I'm thinking about is taking the best of several nights, so increasing the pool of data, um, so maybe trying to get 20,000 frames rather than 5,000, um, and, and maybe I could do that in two nights with half second frames. Another thing I want to try is comparing Cyril, Auto Stackard, and Astro Surface, maybe others if people have suggestions for this kind of stacking and um, quality estimation. And then uh, I'm open to other suggestions for 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 further explore, exploration of this topic. So if you have anything that you I'm not thinking of, and may, maybe you've tried deep sky imaging and have and have tried something different than I have here, um, I'd love to know what else I should be thinking about. Just realize there's one other next step I forgot to put on my slide, which is this is what it looks like with just uh, lucky imaging, the cat's eye nebula, but there's actually an extended shell that you can get with traditional imaging. So I did do a little experiment with that, and this is with five minute exposures uh, and a dual narrowband filter. And then I combined that with my lucky imaging result to sort of resolve the core in there. But this could be much better because this is all from a single night, uh, just like two hours of data uh, on the core and two hours of data with the dual narrowband filter with five minute subs. And so uh, this is something I wanna continue developing and figuring out the best way to combine the short exposures with the long exposures. And so maybe I'll do a video on that if I figure out something good. You are now seeing the names of everyone who supports this channel through my Patreon campaign. The Nebula Photos Patreon is the primary source of income for this channel, and I now also do this full time, so I can't thank my generous Patreon members enough for the support. 
If you're interested in joining, it starts at just $1 a month, and every tier gets access to my Patreon Discord channels, which includes the monthly imaging challenge. And we also meet monthly over Zoom. Uh, there are higher tiers with other perks like ad-free videos starting at $7 a month. And of course, you also get direct messaging support with me. So whether you're just starting out and looking for advice on what gear to get, or you have years of experience, I think there's a lot that I offer through Patreon that will make it worth it to you. When ready to join, head to patreon.com slash nebulaphotos, and I hope to see you there. Till next time, this has been Nico Carver, Clear Skies.